Keith Boykin. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing well, Ricky. How's it going? It's, it's going well, man. It's good to see you again. Good to have you back on the podcast. We're grateful for you coming back and joining us. Uh, how are things doing? How are things doing in my hometown? How's L.A. treating you? You know, I moved to L.A. in January, and um, I signed a six-month lease because I just wanted to try it out. And within, I think, six hours, I knew I was in the right place. Like, I, I wish I had signed a longer lease at that point because – uh, I knew I was going to stay here, so I uh, moved to a new apartment after my lease ended, and uh, now I am here, and I'm loving it. I have no complaints. The weather is great. Uh, the people are nice. The, vi- the vibe is nice and chill. Um, it's been a great experience. Great experience. In okay. fact, weird thing, speaking of great experiences, like I, I chose to live in Hollywood um, here in LA, LA because I, I wanted to be someplace that was where like, you live. Don't tell huh? them where you live. Ask Nancy Pelosi. Don't tell people where you live. I'm not telling them where exactly I live, but <laughs> I'm telling them I live in the, in the city of Hollywood. They can find me in Hollywood. But anyway, I chose, I chose to live in Hollywood. And, um, and, uh, I did that because I wanted, I didn't want to have a car. I wanted to have someplace where I could walk around and, and, you know, see things and meet people and stuff like that. Um, and there's restaurants and bars and gyms and nightclubs and entertainment and theaters and everything nearby within walking distance. I don't even need a car. I didn't even think years ago when I lived in LA in the nineties, I didn't think you could live in LA without a car, but I'm actually doing it. And the other ironic thing about this is just today I was walking to the grocery store and I ran into a, an old friend of mine from law school uh, on my way to the grocery store who lives right across the street from me. But I didn't even know that. Um, and, I don't, I don't. I don't want to identify him, but he's a big wig in, in the in media entertainment world. And uh, I was like, "Wow, it's just crazy!" Like you just run into people like that every day on the street. So, and last night I went to a a, a screening of um, of Viola Davis's uh, Woman King, which I'd seen before, but hadn't seen it with her. Um, so it's just there's a lot of stuff here that is, I'm available to to participate in that I couldn't do when I was in New York. Yeah, that's good. Well, that's good to hear, man. It's good when you take a chance and it and, and works out in your, your favor. That That's a good thing. And that's really kind of the crux of our conversation today. You wrote this uh, dope new book, and I do mean that. I'm not flattering you just to flatter you. I, I enjoyed the book. I enjoyed a lot of what you had to say in the book. Uh, this book about quitting. Um, tell us a little bit about why this book and why now, man. Well, there's, there's, there's two good questions there. Why now is the easier one because mm-hmm. – Last year, 47 million people quit their jobs, and they called it the Great Resignation. It was the biggest mass exodus from the workforce uh, in decades. Um, and the reason why clearly was because of the COVID, in COVID pandemic and the, and the impact of that. But it wasn't entirely because of COVID. COVID was just sort of a, uh, the match that, 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 that got things going, that started the fire. And people realized... First, they started to realize I didn't want to go to a, a job where I felt like I was exposed to potentially deadly virus or, you know, illness. Mm-hmm. Um, second, they started, you know, some people were essential workers. They didn't feel like they should have to, to do that. You, you know, people want to have the freedom to take care of their families and, and see their families. But then other people started to reevaluate their work relationships. A lot of people who used to go to offices all the time started saying, you know what? I like working at home. I'm enjoying working at home. I'm getting more done working at home. I can still take care of my family and get things done during the day. And, you know, I don't necessarily like the idea of going to an office every day and being around people who are making me miserable. So people started to reevaluate the whole relationship with work. Uh, and that all happened, I think, because of that impetus of the, of the pandemic. On top of that, you get to the, the, the earlier question you asked, which is um, why this book? Because for me, this is something I've been dealing with throughout my entire life. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I didn't quit my job last year. I didn't have a job. I haven't had a job, a full-time job, uh, since the nineties and I've been self-employed, um, sometimes successfully, sometimes less successfully, depending on how you define success. <laughs> uh, but I've been self-employed, uh, for all this time and never regretted it because I like the idea of having freedom in my life. And I understood why people were leaving their jobs, why they were quitting their jobs, sometimes to start other jobs. But other jobs that gave them more freedom or other jobs that gave them more money or more autonomy. And life is all about making a series of choices, you know, about what we think works best for us. We don't have to stay wedded to something just because we made a decision 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. 
Uh, absolutely. And, you know, I didn't know until I read the book um, how similar our, our paths have been. You've been wildly successful in yours. I've been modestly successful in mine. But we share that one thing in common. I made a decision years ago that I needed freedom. I needed to figure it out on my own, work for myself, deal with the challenges that that might bring. But I like the freedom. The freedom was worth it, is worth it. There's been ups, there's been downs, but it's always been uh, worth it to me. And, you know, in many ways, clearly, we brought up the word more than once. Freedom, uh, quitting is really about freedom. Uh, and so let's talk about freedom for a minute. I just want to dive into that before we get into the book too deeply. Let's talk about freedom, man. What does freedom mean to you in, in, in the macro sense as a, a general concept? And then what does it mean in the course of this book, the context of this book? Let's talk about what freedom <clears throat> means to you and as you write about it. Well, you know, I'm glad you asked that question because the, the, it's an important question to understand. And freedom for me in the macro sense is a harder one to define because it can be defined negatively or positively. You know, there's a lot of conservatives who talk about freedom these days, but they speak of what I consider to be a negative freedom, a freedom to be able to oppress people, a freedom to say racist, sexist, misogynist, homophobic things, a freedom to, to be an asshole, essentially. And... I recognize that's an aspect of freedom, but when I talk about freedom, I'm speaking about a positive freedom, a freedom to live your life as who you want to be without hurting anybody, uh, a freedom that understands that we are uh, collectively connected to one another, but you get to do what you want to do, and I get to do what I want to do, and we don't have to do the same thing. A freedom that recognizes there are 8 million people, 8 billion people, I should say, on the planet, and that we don't all think the same, want to work the same, or have the same schedules or men mentalities, same ways of learning, same interests, um, same desires about relationships. And we shouldn't all be forced into cookie cutters. So freedom for me in, in the macro sense is a whole sort of global perspective of understanding that we all have agency in our lives. As long as we're not hurting somebody else, we should have the freedom to do whatever we want with our lives. Absolutely. From a micro sense, a personal, granular, individual sense, freedom for me is the ability to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis or on a lifetime basis about who I am, how I choose to show up in the world, how I identify, and where I choose to be. Uh, and that's essentially all it is. I mean, I, like I said, the idea that I could just get up and leave New York and move to Los Angeles in January of this year is a reflection of the sense of freedom I feel like I have. When the COVID pandemic hit, I was able to spend three months in Texas living with my mom. I don't even like Texas, but I was, if you love, you live in Texas, no offense, but, um, <laughs> but I mean, I got to spend three months living with my mom, um, during the COVID pandemic at a time her husband had just passed away in the first week of the, of the pa pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I don't, couldn't have done that if I, you know, was tethered down to a traditional job or had to be in a certain place at a certain time. I had the freedom to do that. It also means freedom in relationships too. You know, I'm not currently in a relationship, but if I am in a relationship in the future, which I imagine I will be at some point, um, you know, I don't want to be in a restrictive relationship where I don't feel like I can't travel this place if I want. I can't hang out with my friends if I want. I, I can't look at someone else if I want. I want, want to be the freedom to be myself. And I want to have that freedom for my partner as well. Well said, man. And I don't, I think sometimes people don't realize how much other people's freedom can actually positively impact you when people are essentially free. And again, free to do the positive things, not free to harm and oppress other people. But when people are free to show up in the world the way they want to and, and, and not do put negativity into the world, um, they're going to generally be more joyful. And the more joyful, more people are, the better the world is, the more we can move through this thing, uh, embracing our agency and not being punished or, or with the threat of you know, bodily harm, physical harm, or psychological harm uh, from, from that freedom. And the better, honestly, I think, that they will be in the workplace. Mm -hmm. If you have more freedom to set your own schedule, to, to work where you work, where you want to work and when you want to work, as long as there are, you know, the indicators of you have to get this done, that done, as long as the work gets done, uh, people I think are more, are more effective and more productive that way because they don't feel like they're doing things that they have to do in somebody else's way or time frame. They're doing it in their own way and time frame and still getting the, the, the things that need to be accomplished. Absolutely. You know, freedom, though, one of the biggest obstacles to freedom quite often is fear. And there's a great quote from Audre Lorde you share in the book when you say, uh, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, 
it, then it becomes less and less important whether I'm afraid. That's a quote from Audrey Lord. Um, you know, again, freedom is quite often one of the barriers to freedom is people's fear, fear of the unknown, fear of what's on the other side of being able to do whatever they want to do, how they want to do it. How did you learn to conquer that fear or at least how to do what needed to be done and move forward despite any fear that you may have felt? Because uh, there's that, you know, sense of security that people have from a nine to five or from the circumstances they're in and the fear of the unknown usually keeps people from liberating themselves. I think you you explained it in the in the question, actually, which was that Audrey Lord inspired me. The, the thing I like about what she says is that she doesn't say you won't be afraid. She says, when you dare to be powerful, it becomes less and less important whether you are afraid when you're acting in service of your vision. And so I feel like, yes, I deal with fear in the same way everybody else does. Every time you try something new or different, there's a fear in, involved in doing that. Um, and the only way I know to be able to process that and not be paralyzed by it is to know that I'm doing this in service of a greater purpose, a greater vision, something that is meaningful to myself or to the world around me, um, or something that just makes me happy and doesn't hurt anybody. You know, so I, I think that that is part of where that freedom comes from. That that whole sort of Audrey Lord sense of of, of individual agency and autonomy. You know, another thing she talks about in that quote, which is really profound when you really unpack it, is this using her strength in the service of her vision. But to me, it's difficult to have a vision for your life until you've really had a chance to understand and embrace who you actually are at your core and start to get a sense of who you are. What did that journey look like for you? And how did you get to a space where you knew enough about yourself to have an idea about what your vision was and that the freedom that it would take to exercise that? Because, you know, I think, you know, people read these things, they hear about the great resignation, they, they hear about people working from home and having more freedom. But if you don't have a context for how you would exist in that freedom or what that means for you, it can be a, it can be a trap for some people. How did you navigate getting to know and being in touch with who you are and understanding what your vision for your life would be? Well, I think part of it I've known all along. Um, I've always had some sort of sense that there was some purpose for my life. Um, and, it, it, you know, when you're a child, certain things resonate with you for reasons that don't make any sense to anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember when I was a kid and I discovered that my birthday, which is August 28th, was on the anniversary of, of the famous March on Washington where Dr. King gave his I Have a Dream speech. Yeah. It was also um, 10 years before exactly before uh, Emmett Till was killed uh, in, in, uh, and murdered in Mississippi. And um, I, I always felt, and there's some sort of reason as a child, you know, you think about these things, oh my God, there must be some, some significance to that. Uh, some sort of reason why I was born on that day. And it may not make sense to anybody. It, it probably wouldn't make sense to me as an adult now, if somebody else told me that. But as a child, that was the way I thought and it impacted the way I saw the world. So I was always involved in doing things to try to change the world because of that. And my sense of self was defined by people who and, and people who had other visions that I kind of associated to myself as believing in. So one was Audre Lorde. Another was Robert Frost, uh, who sort of unusual for to, to choose because he's an old white guy, you think. But mm -hmm. Robert Frost went to the same college I went to. Um, but he went like in 1892 or something like that. Right. And he dropped out before the first year ended. And then he went, on, went off and became a famous poet. And later, because he became so famous, the college brought him back in the 1930s or something and gave him an honorary degree when everybody wanted to be a part of him, part of him then. But, um, there, but he wrote something in one of his poems that I saw at Dartmouth that really, really resonated with me, which was that two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And I've always thought about that. Like, if I just did what everybody else was doing, I'd get the same result everybody else was doing. But if I found a way to take my own road, my own path, then I felt like I would have some, not only greater freedom, but more meaningful experiences for myself. Um, you know, so I'm always telling people who are asking me for advice, um, they're asking what to do. I don't like giving advice because I don't think that, that there's one way to do anything. But the best advice I can oft often tell people is to do what works for you and not what works for everybody else. You know, there's only, there's only one Beyonce, there's only one Oprah, there's, there's, there's only one, you know, a Barack Obama because they chose their own paths. 
And if you try to do exactly the same thing that they're doing the same way they're doing it, you're never going to be as unique as they are. You got to find your own path to get to where you want to go and do it your way. You can learn from them along the way, but you do, you, you have to do it your own way. And so it's almost in some ways a chicken and egg thing. You know, what comes first, the freedom or, or the understanding of self and, and vision? But in some cases, you have to have enough time and enough freedom to even think about and, and ponder who you are and, and what your vision is. And so I guess you have to be on some level comfortable with uncertainty and make that decision internally that having the agency, having the opportunity to have the experiences that you want to have is worth the risk. Would you say that's a fair at some point when I was in law school, I realized when I quote unquote came out that I didn't want to live my life in fear. I wanted to live my life being free. And I decided that I didn't know what the consequences would be, but I was willing to take the leap of being open, honest about my identity, regardless of what the consequences would be, whether I couldn't get a job or couldn't pursue my career ambitions or, or lost everything. I knew that that was more important to me to be free than to um, to live by somebody else's definition of success. And you haven't looked back. And have not looked back since that time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man, this book, again, I really uh, enjoyed it. It spoke to a lot of things that I felt and I've experienced. Uh, and, and you've touched on some things that I've thought about deeply. And, and one of them is this concept that we have nowadays of work-life balance is mm -hmm. a relatively new concept. Because when you think about it in the course of human history, until very recently, until the Industrial Revolution, uh, if you wanted clothes, if you wanted food, if you wanted a roof over your head, you essentially had to wake up at sunset and work until the sun went down to make sure you provided all those things for yourself. People had big families, not only because there wasn't birth control necessarily, but because you needed a big family to tend to the land and to provide and to do the kinds of things you do. And so this notion about quitting being about not working doesn't really work for me. It doesn't work for many because I think people aren't really processing and thinking about that properly. And this is a great quote in the book uh, that you, um, uh, you quoted where it says the only place where success comes before work is in the dictionary. But what I want to talk about with you, Matt, is your point of view on the reality of work, but it's varying needs on fulfilling our needs and, and fulfilling uh, ourselves as a pathway to, in, you know, embodying who we want to be in the world. You don't necessarily do anything without work, but work can work for you. I'm interested in your points of view about that because you share some interesting ones in the book. Well, yeah, I think work-life balance is a relatively new concept for many of us, but um, I think it's something that we knew in our hearts all along, but just didn't have the language for it. And we knew that at some point, we were tired and ready to go home. We knew that we didn't want to work on weekends. We didn't want to have to work overtime without being compensated for it. We didn't want to have to do somebody else's job just because that somebody got laid off and then you didn't hire somebody else to, to replace them uh, without getting paid extra for it, without getting a promotion or a raise for it. Mm -hmm. We knew that there, somehow we knew that there were boundaries instinctively or intuitively that were being violated and broken in the workplace that we wanted to sort of recapture or reestablish. And I think that's part of what happened in the great resignation period and what is still happening today. And what will continue happening with the evolution of, of technology uh, and automation in the workplace. And people are sort of redefining what that means, but it does not mean that you have to stop working. When I talk about quitting, I'm talking about quitting unhealthy behaviors in our life. And going to work and identifying your life based on your work is one of those unhealthy behaviors. It doesn't mean that you have to quit your job. I think people misinterpret that, although that's certainly one way to do it. But uh, I'm not encouraging people to do that. It does mean that we have to quit the mentality that teaches us that our jobs define us. Yes. You know, and I, I mentioned there's a story I talk about in the book of when I was in Spain as a foreign studies student uh, in Granada, the University of Granada in college. And I met this bartender uh, who told me that Americans have a different attitude about work than, than Spaniards do. And part of the reason why this came up is because they had the siesta hour every day back then for like two hours or so where everything closes down. And as an American, young capitalist in, you know, in the 1980s, I'm thinking, this doesn't make any sense. It's inefficient. If I want to get go and buy a razor, I should be able to buy a razor at one o'clock in the afternoon. Why is everything closed down? And 
I realized that when, when he said this, it hit me. He said, Americans, that you live to work. And in Spain, we work to live. And I hadn't thought about it that way until that moment. I realized, yeah, why are we spending so much of our lives focused on our work instead of our lives? Absolutely. Um, and it gave me a new perspective. And then when you think about it, not only do we live to work, but we live to work for other people's benefit. Hello. Hello. That's exactly the problem. I work hard. I work very hard. In fact, I've, I've been telling people I've worked harder this year than I've worked in a long time, even though I'm telling people quit this whole thing. But I'm working for myself. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I would want to be doing working as hard as I am right now for Xerox. I, I always say Xerox because that was like the first company my father worked for. It was not even in, in, in business anymore. But I wouldn't want to be working that hard for Amazon or, you know, Coca-Cola or something like that. I, I want to be working hard for myself and helping to, to build my own dreams. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a big chunk of the audience uh, for the podcast is creatives and particularly creatives of color. And I know as a creative myself, um, you know, freedom is great and, and, and quitting the nine to five sounds good on paper uh, because you're so tired after working all week for somebody else. It's difficult to be creative and focused on creativity. At the same time, it's difficult to be focused on creativity when you're worried about what you're going to eat or paying your rent. And I know that you face some of those challenges in your life and career. What has been some of the tactics and what some of the things that you've used to get yourself through those difficult times and really stay true to yourself and to your dream of having this freedom? Um, well, I feel like I don't necessarily know that I have the tactics that I thought about and said, this is the tactic I'm going to use. It's just kind of like negotiating and navigating my way through different experiences and learning from those experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so in some instances, I find um, just listening to my, my heart and what my heart is telling me to do is it's helpful. In some instances, I find that six, that failure is an indicator of, of where I should be going and where I shouldn't be going. I talk about that in the book where I've had these experiences where I thought that this is what I was going to do. I was going to try a new career and do something different. And didn't work out. Mm -hmm. um, and that failure was actually a good thing for me because it opened my mind to try to do something else. Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned this in the context I was going to be a law professor. I, I, and I had all these job offers to be a law professor. But they're all in places I didn't want to live. Um, like I think Indiana, and Florida, and Texas. I wanted to be in New York or D.C. Uh, and I didn't get any job offers in, in, in D.C. So finally, I... Um, when I found out I didn't get the job I wanted in D.C., I, I hung up the phone and called up my best friend and told him, you know what? I'm moving to New York. Had no plan for what I was going to do in New York. I just knew I'd been in D.C. for eight years. I was feeling it's time for me to try something new. And I'm glad I did because it encouraged me to come to New York. I had a chance to meet you and meet so many other wonderful people and try new things. And had to do, I got a chance to do CNN and MSNBC and be a, go on a reality show and start an organization and, and just do things that I never would have done if I'd been a law professor, you know, writing law review articles for the rest of my life. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I had similar experiences. I worked for a hard rock cafe for years in corporate and uh, I got an offer to be the director of marketing in Europe. And it sounds great on paper. You'll travel Europe and, and whatever. But my daughter was young at the time. I, you know, did a cost uh, benefit analysis is based in London. I lived in LA at the time. It was like 180% more expensive to live in London. When I did the math, it made no sense to work as hard as I was going to work for what essentially was going to add up to a pay cut after I factored in ex uh, expenses. And so, you know, shortly after I made that decision, uh, I got back to L.A. Um, they told me that, well, we understand that you didn't take it, and I think it's a smart decision for you. But unfortunately, we're closing the L.A. office, and so you have a choice. You can move to Orlando, Florida, or you can take the package. And at that moment, I thought, you know what? I'm a musician. I'm an artist. I'm tired. I'm drained from this anyway. Give me the package. I'm moving to New York. I'm going to explore a different per part of myself and my life. And I've never looked back. And there's been some challenges here without a doubt. But I just share that for people that on the other side of that fear and the other side of that trepidation is your freedom. And yes, there's some sacrifice and some, and some struggle sometimes in that journey, but it's always worth it. Aren't you worth it? Don't you want to bet on yourself and, and who you were created to be in this world? And, you know, you writing this book, man, I really appreciate you writing it because I think it's going to provide context for a lot of people who are struggling with this right now and are, and are thinking about it. But I will say this, and it leads into my next question. Um, you know, the question is about the contingencies. 
that, you know, people should consider to put in a place when they're contemplating, whether they're formally quitting a job or formally quitting a relationship. But what are some of the contingencies people should consider? For me, that move to New York was a smooth one because I also had saved thousands of dollars up. So I had a cushion to kind of land on when I was here for the first six months. What are some contingencies that have helped you along the way? Well, I think um, it, for me, it hasn't been financial contingencies. Mm-hmm. It's been um, personality contingencies uh, in, in the sense that I've always been hard headed and determined to do whatever I wanted to do. So if I make up my mind to do something, I'm going to make it happen. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to make it happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I, like I said, when I moved to New York, I had no plan to what I was going to do. I didn't have any resources. New, and I didn't realize New York was as expensive as it was to live there. I figured it was going to be relatively similar to D.C. Plus, you have to go through a whole broker system to get an apartment in New York, and it's just so complicated and ridiculous. And I, I didn't know what I was getting into, but I knew that I was going to make it work. And I, I think because I had this sort of confidence in myself that irrespective of the circumstances, I could figure out a way to make it work, that belief and faith in myself is, is, the, is the number one contingency that's helped me survive. It hasn't been because I've always had, you know, that's the other thing. People, several people have said to me that they thought, that, oh, I must be independently wealthy because I, you know, I quit my job and everything and haven't worked for it. I am not independently wealthy. I've uh, never been rich, uh, but I am rich in life experiences in that I've had a chance to live my life the way I wanted to live my life. And it's because I've just made a commitment to do that. That is not the way everybody works. So some people don't feel comfortable taking those risks and they don't feel comfortable living in that gray area of un- uncertainty and instability. Uh, and I don't really like being an uncertain, un, in, 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 uncertain, un, in, in, and unstable, unstable, yeah. unstable. I can't remember unstable, unstable at the same time. But um, I do like living out my dreams. And so, uh, if I have to go through temporary uncertainty to get to permanent freedom, then I'm willing to do that. Yeah, and that that comment that you made when people ask questions about are you independently wealthy? I mean, you know, in their defense, people. Quite often, I look at people who are courageous to, to bet on themselves and to take extreme risks, and they look for ways to justify them not doing it. Fundamentally, as a, as a, as a species, as a human race, we are generally risk adverse, and that's what got us to where we are right now. But on the other hand, the other thing that got us to where we are is those people who are comfortable walking on the edge comfortable looking over that cliff and seeing what's there. And sometimes we lose some of those people, but they help to bring us and pull us forward. And so, again, I think it's really about people doing what works best for them, what they're comfortable with, uh, but then owning that, you know, owning that you have agency and you decided to use it or not use it in a particular way. Uh, But look at look at what you've done and understand that you are on some level responsible for where you are and, and where you're going with the choices that you are comfortable making. The other thing you talk about candidly in the book, though, is for you and even and for myself, um, I made some bets on myself early to get a particular kind of education, to, to take every job, no matter how menial it was, take every job seriously and learn everything I could from it, because then that gave me tools and resources within me that could help me weather those storms when I sacrificed and I took a chance on myself, because it has not. I just want to make sure people are clear. It has not been smooth sailing for either one of us. There are times like, well, how am I going to pay this bill? Am I going to eat? But you had the tools, you had the education, you had things to lean to fall back on. Would you say that's a fair assessment for you and, and for people, again, just to think about what are you doing? How are you preparing yourself to, to take the risk on yourself? Oh, I think that's absolutely right. I love the way you described all of that. And I think, you know, there are times when I was, um, you know, broke and not sure how I was going to survive uh, one day to the next. And um, I think part of the reason why I could keep going is because I just had to believe in myself that somehow there was a reason for me to be doing this, to be on this path. You know, they say, you, you know, if you believe in God, God didn't bring us this far just to bring us this far. Mm-hmm. And I didn't feel like I had been brought as far as I had been brought in life just to just to be there. I felt like I was supposed to be continuing, and I still feel like I'm supposed to be continuing to contribute something to the world to do something. Now, the problem for me is that you know I made some risks, took some risks, and made some decisions in my life that put me in financially uncomfortable positions. 
right out of college, my first job, I was paid $250 a week, uh, which is not enough to pay my bills and my student loans. But I had a great job working for a presidential campaign. And um, I didn't know if I was going to ever pay off or not. But, you know, almost every single person I've met um, in my professional career uh, in politics um, had some connection to that first campaign I worked in, believe it or not. Like a lot of people I know in the world, including George Stephanopoulos, you know, and uh, who, who's on ABC and, and John King, who uh, was um, is on CNN. Uh, and I was just having a conversation the other day about Kevin Merida, uh, who's an editor at LA Times here. I, I was thinking all these people I met in Dukakis campaign back in 1988. Donna Brazil. I mean, I met so many people and I stayed in touch with them and met other people through them. It got me into the 1992 campaign, got me to meet Bill Clinton, got me to work in the White House. That one enormous risk that cost me a lot of money and put me in debt and fucked up my credit, that risk uh, really paid off in the long term, even though in the short term, it was just, it was kind of devastating. Yeah. It's really about having a long term vision for your life and understanding that thing. And that's the other thing I think is missing for so many of us. Well, one of my greatest lessons I've learned in life is patience. Patience. Bet on yourself, but understand that these things don't necessarily and rarely do they happen overnight. You've got to be patient and understand that those valleys uh, and those peaks are, are both part of your growing process. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was having dinner the other night um, here in L.A. with a friend of mine and um, uh, Billy Porter walk, walked in and we spoke and talked to each other. I haven't seen Billy Porter in a few years, but we used to live near each other in Harlem. And I remember... Back in the days when Billy was struggling, um, and I would run into him at the, the grocery store. What's that grocery store in Adam Clayton Powell that closed down, that, that reopened, I guess? Best yet. Best yet. Best yet. Yeah, mm -hmm. they reopened to something else. I would run into Billy at the grocery store from time to time. We'd talk, and he'd tell me he's working on this project, working on that project. Then one day, Billy Porter, Porter struck gold, and next thing you know, he had a Tony Award. Next thing you know, he had a TV show. Next thing you know, he was on the red carpet. He was in the Met Gala. You know, it's just you know, and he'd been, it, he, he, people, some people think of him sort of an overnight success, but he had been in the trenches for decades doing this work, producing, singing, writing, creating, acting, you know, and, and then it just all paid off. So, you know, I, I think of people who, who spent their lives doing something and then, uh, and didn't necessarily think they were going to be rewarded for it financially, but still enjoyed doing it. Uh, and then at some point they did get some sort of reward for it as well. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean everybody will get that, but, you never know if you give up before you you've given all you can for yourself. You know, abs absolutely. Uh, you know, it seems obvious to me when you think about, and I'm a bell hooks fanatic. Um, and she shared this definition of love from M. Scott Peck, which is love is the will to extend oneself for one's own spiritual, uh, growth one or another spiritual growth. And it seems obvious to me, man, that loving oneself, uh, obviously means providing for one's needs, of course, but on a much deeper level, it means investing in your own humanity so that you have the opportunity to, to grow spiritually. You have the opportunity to live life fully. Um, and so to, to take a bet on yourself the way we're talking about doing, you have to at some point really embrace and understand who you are and love yourself. What role did that play in your early you know, career and your decision banking process? And, and, and did you have any ways of getting into that and, and connecting with yourself? Are you just inherently one of those people? I know for me, it's been a journey to really get to loving myself, you know, being a black gay man and all that that represents. It took a while for me to love myself, but loving myself and not loving what I'm supposed to be in this world is what propels me forward. It's what allows me to bet on myself. What's been the role of love in your journey towards quitting and towards being free and embracing freedom the way you have? That was a great question. There's so much you said in that. That was like an essay that I could just uh, sort of repeat. But, um, you know, I, I love M. Scott Peck. He was, he was the one that wrote The Road Less Traveled, right? Yes, um, absolutely. And, and I love Bell Hooks. I love that whole definition of love. It made me think about why I, even at this age, even though I'm not religious, I still identify as spiritual and Christian, only because for me, my Christian faith is, is really about one passage in the Bible from Matthew 22, where Jesus is approached by the Pharisees and they ask him, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. And to me, that's what it was all about. Um, like, oh, this is the, if you had to, 
to define what my faith is about in one word, it's love. If you had to define what, what Jesus, I thought, thought represented in one word, it was love. If you had to define what Dr. King was talking about when he mentioned the beloved community and this dream for America, it was love. That was the common denominator in all. And I've always believed in this sort of juxtaposition between fear and love that a lot of the spiritual talkers, spiritual thinkers talk about. Um, and I think Marianne Williamson has written a lot about this too. You know, the idea that there's, there's a, there's a, the, there are only two emotions in the world, fear and love. Mm -hmm. And that everything we're doing is either based on one of those two things, not love and hate. It's either fear or love. And I, I, that resonated with me as I learned more about those concepts. And I realized that I think I had gotten a lot of the love I needed as a child from the affirmation from my family. Uh, but that was a different type of love because it was an affirmation for success. And I was good in school. I was an athlete. I was, uh, I was an, an extra, involved in extracurricular activities and student council president and stuff like that. And so it was easy to get love for that. But I had to find a way to love myself for myself, regardless of whether I did anything or not. And that was something that came to me in that same process when I started to come to terms with my sexual orientation. Because then I realized there was nobody else in my family who was black and gay. You know, my, my uncle was, but he was killed and, and murdered in, years ago in 1980. But nobody else in my family I knew who was black and gay. So I had to find a way to love myself. And um, one of the best places I found for that was the book Brother to Brother. Oh, yes. um, by Essex Hempel, the anthology, New Writings by Black Gay Men. And there's so many stories that were just affirming to me about the black gay experience. And I realized I was a part of this rich history that was that was preceded me. And it wasn't just me in the 1990s waking up and being the first black gay person in the world. There were centuries and centuries of people and, and people in recent history who were making enormous difference. And I was a part of that tradition and I wanted to carry that on. So all those things helped to, to propel me forward in understanding about my ability to love myself. That's, that's important. And I think love is essential to everything that we're facing right now, including this moment that we're in, in terms of quitting. Um, the greatest act of love that you can have is this thing, if this thing called capitalism in its current form is not nurturing us, if it's not building healthy families, if it's not building a healthy society, then the most loving thing we can do is to alter our interaction with it or change it or whatever we need to do. But you've got to quit things sometimes that you love in order for you and for them to become better or transform into something that serves you. Um, and I know you're not a fortune teller and none of us are, but what do your instincts tell you about this moment that we're in and, and where it may lead as it, as it, you know, um, relates specifically to quitting and to how people interact with the workforce and in, in the workforce and with capitalism? Well, as you were speaking, it made me think of a couple of things um, to, to say before I even think about where, where we go from here with, with capitalism and work. But um, one of those is uh, a pass. Well, they're both musical selections. One is from Whitney Houston, which I always talk about the, the, the song. I know she didn't, she, she didn't make it, but The Greatest Love of All. Uh, she didn't write it, but I, I love when she says, you know, everybody's looking for a hero. I never found anyone who could fulfill that need a lonely place to be until I learned to depend on me. The greatest love of all was inside of her, in a, inside of all of us. And I, I think that that was, that. every time I hear that song, it just it's, it's one of those songs that it's like an anthem for me. It reminds me of who I am. Another song I really love that really affirms me is a song from Nat King Cole, which again, he didn't write, but I love his version of it, which is um, Nature Boy, uh, where he says, uh, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. Mm -hmm. And I just, it, you know, there are two, two, two different things. One is sort of talking about a relationship, a type of love. The other is talking about a self-love. But they're both talking about love. And, you know, we're in this world that's so complicated now with that technology and automation and artificial intelligence. This ha artificial intelligence and uh, chaos in the political situation, the international upheaval and pandemics and inflation. There's so many things for us to talk about and be concerned about and worried about. But at the end of the day, we make our lives so complicated. And I do this. I do this as well all the time. We make our lives so complicated, but at the end of the day, it's all about love. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there, you know, we're sometimes we're trying to figure out what's the key to life, what's the key to success. I don't know what that is. I don't know any of that stuff. I, I don't know anybody who really does. If, you know, no matter what they say. But I know one thing: that love is the key to everything. It's the key to to making this whole thing called us, called humanity, survive. We have to learn to love each other and to love ourselves. 
Absolutely. Any parting words, man, for folks who are considering quitting, whether it's their job or a relationship that doesn't serve them well or other circumstances, any advice uh, for people? I'm yeah. What your thoughts are. Yeah. Uh, first of all, don't quit your job just because you heard me on this, <laughs> on this podcast. But if you want to quit your job, find a way to do it and do it. If you want to quit with your a situation you're in, that's not healthy for you, a relationship, find a way to do it and do it. If you want to quit a city that you're living in or a place you're living in or something that isn't serving your needs, you have the power to do that. We have the ability to make choices in our lives. And even if we've made mistakes in the past and we feel guilty or ashamed because of those mistakes, you have the right to make a change, of course. You have the right to do something entirely different. You have the right to decide today, at this very moment, that you're going to make a commitment to your own freedom, your own autonomy, and live your life differently. And it doesn't mean you have to do it right away, but it means you can start making a plan to do it if that makes you feel more comfortable. But commit to yourself, believe in yourself, and ultimately that will always pay uh, the best rewards. Well said, my friend, well said. And if I may add, you guys, listen, we are two, Keith may or may not co-sign on this, but we are two ordinary people who have been blessed to live extraordinary lives because we chose freedom and to believe in ourselves. Wasn't always easy. Rarely is this easy, but we loved ourselves enough to bet on ourselves and have no regrets. So I encourage each of you to go inside to understand and get to know who you are, to embrace and to love your authentic self enough that you will be in a space where you're comfortable enough, loving yourself enough to bet on yourself, to bet on freedom and quit things that do not serve you. Keith Boykin, I appreciate you being with us today. Where can people find the book? Tell people the title of the book again. We're going to put it in the show notes for everybody, but I just want you from your lips to their ears to share what the name of the book is and where people can get it. Thank you, Ricky. The book is called Quitting, Why I Left My Job to Live a Life of Freedom. It's published exclusively by Scribd, S-C-R-I-B-D, and you can find it online at Scribd.com. You can read it for free. You don't have to buy it at all. It's like Scribd is like the Netflix for books. You just sign up, sign up for the platform and you can read all the books you want, including mine. And, um, yeah, I, I, I just, it's, 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 it's a whole new way of, of accessing books, but I encourage you to check it out there or you can go to one of my social media platforms on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram and find me at Keith Boykin and you'll find a link to the book. All right. And we, again, you guys, we'll put that in the show notes for you. So once again, Keith Boykin, Keith, thanks for joining us today, man. I appreciate you. Thank you, Ricky. I appreciate you.